All right, in this video, we're gonna talk about the GABA-A receptor. The GABA-A receptor has a lot of really cool applications and it's talked about in a lot of classes such as advanced organic, biochemistry, physiology, cell biology. And one of the reasons it's kind of cool is because first of all, it's a great example of allosteric regulation. Um, and I think it's more intuitively understood by most people. Not only that, it's also the target of a lot of things, molecules, things that we intake through the diet or drugs that we're used to hearing about all the time. And we'll go into that actually at the very end of this video and then um, we'll actually look at some more of that in some, new, some other videos, okay? So what does the GABA-A receptor do? Well, first of all, it binds GABA. GABA is an acronym for gamma aminobutyric acid. That's a neurotransmitter shown right here. There's its structure. GABA is widely known as the most important primary central nervous system inhibitory neurotransmitter. And long story short, for the GABA-A receptor, whenever GABA binds to its binding site on the receptor, um, the GABA receptor has a channel that opens and allows a chloride ion to move through. And specifically, specifically, the chloride ion is gonna move from the extracellular side into the cell to the intracellular side, okay? The net effect of this is that it hyperpolarizes a neuron membrane, okay? So these GABA-A receptors are located in neuron membranes, uh, normally in the dendrites and the cell body of the neuron. And whenever there's enough GABA binding to all these GABA receptors that are in the, in the membrane, the cell will volunteer to hyperpolarize and that neuron will be inhibited, okay? So first of all, um, what we said, it's a membrane protein. GABA binds somewhere on the extracellular domain. In fact, you can see it's actually right here. This is actually looking at it from the top. So if you look at a top right here, that's this, and you can see GABA binds right here. There's also another binding site right here. Um, you see this BZ right here, what is that? That's not GABA. We'll talk about that in a couple of slides. That's actually a benzodiazepine, okay, like Xanax, or flunitrazepam, or something like that. Um, you've probably heard of Valium. Valium is also a benzodiazepine, okay? Also, the GABA-A receptor is an ionotropic receptor. So there are two kinds of receptors um, normally that are in membranes. They're ionotropic and metabotropic. Ionotropic are the simplest receptors. Um, and those are simplest because those are receptors that control and operate an ion channel that's in the same protein as the receptor. So in other words, this whole thing has both a channel and a receptor. The benefit of having this is that you don't need a second messenger to activate the actual ion channel. Whereas for metabotropic receptors, if this was a metabotropic receptor, somewhere over here, you would see a completely separate protein. So what would have to happen is you would have to have the ligand, whatever neurotransmitter, bind to the receptor. You activate something usually like a G protein, second messenger that goes over here activates this and then the ion moves through. So metabot metabotropic receptors are more complicated, but the GABA-A receptor is um, more simplistic because it's ionotropic. GABA binds and a chloride ion flexes through. Now, here's a little more detail on the structure of the GABA receptor. Um, you can see here, here's kind of the individual subunits. Um, you can see in the very center, that's the chloride channel, okay? Generally, chloride is going to flux from the extracellular side to the intracellular side when GABA binds, okay? Now, not only are there two main GABA binding sites, but there's also a benzodiazepine binding site, and there are other sites also that can allosterically modulate the activity of the GABA receptor. Okay, so first of all, what is allosteric modulation? Okay, so normally if we assume no allosteric modulators, so we just have normal physiology going on, GABA binds to the receptor and a chloride ion moves through, right? Okay, simple as that, but that GABA um, the effectiveness of it is how tight it binds to the GABA receptor, its binding site. How tight does it bind? Well, normally, under normal conditions, there's a certain, what we call a KD, that it has for the receptor. Uh, the lower the KD, the tighter it binds. The higher the KD, the weaker it binds. Well, KD has a, well, the GABA has a certain KD for that receptor. Well, if we have a positive allosteric modulator that binds to the GABA receptor, generally what that's going to do is it's going to alter the affinity of GABA for that, for that receptor. And so what happens is, is the KD becomes lowered. 
okay? And so GABA binds tighter, and so more chloride ions move through, okay? And it turns out that benzodiazepines are positive allosteric modulators, but there are also other, there are other molecules that can actually serve in this way as well. Okay, first of all, we have GABA. That's not an allosteric modulator, that's a normal ligand. But we actually have three positive allosteric modulators that are fairly common. The first one I've mentioned is a benzodiazepine. This is the general structure, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this one is actually Xanax. Okay, so Xanax is going to be able to bind to the benzodiazepine site, and that enhances GABA binding and it causes chloride ions, to, more chloride ions to be able to move through, and it further hyperpolarizes the membrane. This over here, this molecule is called a barbiturate. Um, barbiturates are commonly known as tranquilizers. They're not really used much anymore um, because they are extremely dangerous. They can actually kill people in higher concentrations. Um, and so the benzodiazepine is preferentially used over the barbiturate. This specific one is phenobarbital. Okay, phenobarbital um, is going to bind to a barbiturate site on the GABA receptor, and that's going to, in some ways, do the same thing as benzodiazepine bi binding. Okay, now arguably the most common one that we all know about is ethanol. So most people just simply, simply refer to it as alcohol, but ethanol is going to be able to bind to an ethanol binding site. It's kind of strange that there's an ethanol binding site. It turns out that methanol can do this also, and to some small extent isopropyl alcohol, but obviously we're not drinking methanol, we're not drinking isopropyl alcohol, hopefully that's what we use to clean the lab benches in the lab. Ethanol, though, is going to bind here and also act as a positive allosteric modulator, okay, and enhance GABA binding and enhance the function of the GABA receptor so we get more hyperpolarization. Well, one thing you need to associate um, increased central nervous system hyperpolarization with is a sedative effect or a relaxing effect. In fact, whenever you go to sleep at night, most of your central nervous system uh, neurons, at least the ones that are active when you're awake, they become hyperpolarized, and that's one of, that's a that's an, a criminally oversimplified way of describing what happens when you sleep. But what ethanol and benzodiazepines are going to do is they're going to relax you, okay? And that's because they act as positive allosteric modulators of the GABA A receptor. All right. Um, ethanol, as we've said, is an allosteric activator or positive allosteric modulator of the GABA A receptor. And I have here some Jim Beam whiskey, some bourbon, whatever you want to call it. Obviously, there's ethanol in here. Um, it's about 35%. We don't need to go into that. But ethanol is one of the most widely used anxiolytic uh, molecules. An anxiolytic molecule is, is sort of, you can think of it as a relaxant or an anti-anxiety um, kind of molecule. Obviously, benzodiazepines are prescribed as anti-anxiety or relaxants, but obviously if you're 21, you can go into the liquor store and buy these. And what we say is ethanol decreases the KD of GABA for the receptor, and that means that GABA can essentially bind more tightly. Okay, And so because, because we are um, enhancing the function of the GABA receptor, um, we get more hyperpolarization of neurons, and then we can also get some relaxation effects out of that potentially. Um, we should know this is beside the point of this video, but I do have another video that explains this in more detail. Ethanol is primarily metabolized in the liver by alcohol dehydrogenase. So in other words, eventually this anxiolytic effect will wear off because the ethanol is metabolized by a normal pathway in the liver. Okay. So hopefully this gave you some information, some useful knowledge relating to the GABA A receptor and its function, and maybe some of the positive allosteric modulators that we're commonly used to hearing about that might um, provide some pharmacological effects. In the next video, we're going to go over GABA metabolism. We're going to go over its synthesis and then its degradation. See you in the next video.